Good morning. Good morning. Whew, so nice to be here. A little hot up here, or the monitors, I think. Got a little reverb. Got my grandpa glasses on here. I have fantastic sight distance, but if I have anything closer than my hand, I have difficulty reading it. My arms just aren't long enough anymore to hold it out like I used to. <laughs> so some of you can feel my pain. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I bless you this morning. It's great to be here. Um, and I um, just want to say I honor Pastor Chris, our apostolic covering this morning. Just want to bless him yeah. and Margie and hope they have a time of refreshing. And um, what great folks. And um, this, the children and all, really all of you. I, we, we just uh, love this body. And um, Lori and I came here uh, October, I think, of 2015. And just really fell in love. And, um, and so while we're laboring down in White Sox, remember we're still part of Johnson yeah. City. And, um, and so I want to give you a good report. Things are going really good in White Sox. Uh, pa- Pastor Tim is doing a fantastic job. We're sharing a lot of the preaching duties, but he's been doing a little bit more recently than I have because of my work schedule. And then we were out of town uh, down in Florida last week. Uh, I've got the sunburn to prove it. And... Um, and so, but anyhow, God has drawn together a people that are hungry and a people that uh, are excited. And so, um, so anyhow, that's, that's always fun. And uh, I bless you. I pray that uh, uh, you're as excited as I am this morning. And um, <clears throat> so I love the praise and worship here as always. And so uh, uh, it's always great to be here. So anyhow, I want to talk about something that was, uh, I talked about last time I was here and spoke on a Wednesday night. Uh, if you want to really probably get the most benefit out of the message this morning, it'd be a good idea for you to go back and look on the church YouTube page and look at the message I preached here uh, March 31st. But um, um, how many of you know, if something's me- mentioned once in Scripture, it's probably important, but the more frequently it's mentioned, how many of you think maybe it's a little more important, right? And so... Um, I want to talk to you about something that's mentioned in the scripture frequently by Christ himself, and that's the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Amen? Uh, it's interesting, a, a couple years ago when we were living down in the D.C. area, uh, I was asked to lead a, a home group. <clears throat> and so we led a home group, and, and how many of you know a home group are, is people that are part of your church? And so we had a, um, a weeknight meeting with uh, our home group, and it was probably about eight people, so like four or five couples so maybe 10 people, and, um, <clears throat> and so I kind of led that, and we talked about some stuff, and then one, dis- one time I decided, well, it'd be good to, to teach a series on the kingdom of God, and uh, it was a very interesting response that I got out of the folks. Now, these are all people that probably grew up in church, and um, the response was, hmm, the kingdom of God. I never thought of that. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. It isn't an interesting that almost every Sunday we preach about you must be born again. But Jesus never preached you must be born again. He mentioned it one time in a private conversation with Nicodemus. Now I'm not saying that it's not important because it is, right? right? To be born from above, to be born of the Spirit is very important. But he mentioned it one time in a private conversation to Nicodemus, and that's almost all you're going to hear preached most Sunday mornings. At least reference is going to be made to it. And so that's very interesting, I think. If we believe that Scripture is important and how frequently something is mentioned or a topic is referenced in Scripture, it just seems to reason that we would recognize that there was no singular topic Christ talked about, referred about more than the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And those terms are interchangeable. The kingdom of God talks about God, Yahweh, being the sovereign of that kingdom. And the kingdom of heaven is the nature of the kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Amen? Amen? And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. But one of the things, there's a couple things I'd like to lay as groundwork. And it wouldn't be a bad idea for you if you're going to write some stuff down this morning and look back at it later on. Um, You might want to write down that kingdom of God refers to the sovereign of that kingdom. Kingdom of heaven 
is the nature of the kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Those are interchangeable terms. They may, they're referencing the same thing. But it gives us a little bit, it draws us a picture, right? Another thing I'd like you to mention or write down is Scripture comes in several different classifications. I, what I call, I, I like to classify things. It just helps me understand. And so a lot of Scripture is historic. Other scripture is prophetic. Other scripture is symbolic. Other scripture is poetic. So write those down. Historic, when it talks about, you know, who was the son of who, uh, who was the son of who, who was the son of that person, and so and so was the mother of that person. That's historic. That's giving you history. One of the things I remember when I was in college is I, I had a professor for Western civilization. He said he was a lawyer. And he was teaching college uh, as a side gig. But he said, one of the things that we know about the Bible is that it's very historically accurate. And so scripture is historic, prophetic, all right, lots of prophecy in the Bible, symbolic. Much of the book of Revelation is symbolic. A lot of Revelation uh, in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel, very symbolic. And poetic, like Song of Solomon, some of the Psalms and Proverbs, okay? Um, another thing that we must understand, if we're going to come to really understand scripture is the language of the Spirit. Everybody say language of the Spirit. Of the Spirit. It's, very under, it's very important for us to recognize the language of the Spirit. When Jesus talked much of the time, he talked in parables. And a parable is a natural story with a spiritual application. And so, you know, and all of us have probably heard, you know, if you've ever had anybody say, well, why did Jesus teach in parables? And you'll hear people say, because parables are easy to understand. That is 180 degrees wrong. Jesus said the very opposite. And so the language of the Spirit is parable, allegory, type and shadow, symbols, numbers. And so over and over throughout the Scripture, we see Jesus say this this. Uh, this uh, comment, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, do you think he's talking about these ears? No. I'm going to guarantee you 99.999% of the people that were listening when he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, they had these. Yeah. I'm just going to put it out. I'm, I'm stepping out on a limb. I'm just going to guess they had them. <laughs> right? And so what was he talking about? You see, throughout the, throughout the New Testament, when he, he talks in pra, parables and proverbs, what he's saying is, is that, listen, there are mysteries. And what's a mystery? A mystery is a hidden thing. How many of you want to know some mysteries? Yeah. The neat thing about a mystery is not everybody knows it. And so a mystery, it's a Greek term, musterion, and it's, it's just, it simply means it's a hidden thing. It's a secret. Now, you know what happens to secrets. What happened when, uh, when, when Christ healed somebody and he said, oh, now don't go tell anybody where you got this. What did they do? Blah, blah. If, if we were told to gossip the gospel, man, the world would have been saved a long time ago. <laughs> right? And so, um, so anyhow, the cool thing about a mystery is not everybody gets it. Now, how many of you ever been on an inside, in on an inside joke, right? Yeah. Like, so, so let's say uh, uh, me and uh, let's say me, me and Keith ran on an inside joke about Gary. <laughs> oh crap! Yeah. Uh, so the inside joke was uh, maybe Jerry's walking around with his zipper down, didn't know about it. Or Gary. <laughs> All right, so we look at Gary and Keith, and I like, <laughs> you know. Well, if we loved Gary, we'd tell him, hey. Barn doors open, right? <laughs> but the nice thing about it, the funny thing about a mystery is, is that not everybody knows it. And so, um, and so you know, the kingdom of God has a lot of mysteries. And uh, not everybody is privy to the mystery. One of the things I learned a long time ago is that it's hard to teach a couple different types of people anything. 
The first type of person that it's hard to teach them anything is the person who thinks they already know. See, I can't teach him anything. No, but it's hard. I mean, how many of you know, I've, my kids are all adults now, but you know what? When they're about 13, 14, 15, they know everything. They, especially the boys. My daughter wasn't as bad, but my boys, I'd tell them something. Dad, oh, father, father. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, it's like, hey, I'm just telling you this. If you do this, this will be what happens. Dad, I'm not stupid. They go and they do it. And come to find out they actually were. And so what is interesting, the transformation that you see over time, like, you know, my boys, um, you know, 13, 14, 15. And of course, what happens is, is they think they're men. In their mind, they think they're men. But socially and, and, and mentally, they're not matured to the place where they're men, but they think they're men. And so, you know, but you find out how much men they are when you tell, give them a task. Go out and shovel that dirt and move it over there. You find out, okay. I tell you, the real responsibility, how do you know someone's a man? Are they responsible? Don't tell me about how much hair you got on your chest. <laughs> All right, how big your muscles are. I don't care about any of that. Can you be responsible? One of the things that the Lord told me a long time ago is go home and be responsible for your finances. And I'll just tell you what the, how the Lord spoke to me about that, is that to go home and be responsible for your finances and stop putting that pressure on your spouse. Now, that's me. But what I'm telling you is, is that some things are better for you as a husband to shoulder. That doesn't mean that you don't, you know, you don't work on it together. Right. All right? But when you have little kids at home, you have limited resources, and your wife is fretting and fussing and, 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 and worried, I found out that, that I could handle that a lot better, and I didn't lose any sleep about it. Part of the problem was is that our, you know, our, our, um, our sense of what was important was different. See, for, for me as a dad, I learned this awesome word, no. <laughs> and so, you know, when my kids were growing up, they would want to do this and do that. Let me ask, let me tell you, just, just give you a clue. Do you want above average children? Yeah. Then stop letting them do what the average kid does. All my kids are exceptional in their own way. But to get there, you have to stop listening to everything they say and whine about. And, um, you know, and so, you know, all the kids are going to go do this. I'd say, you're not. But everyone else is. Not everyone, because you're not. <laughs> everybody's parents let them do this. Not everybody's, because this parent's not. That's okay. You see, we've got a responsibility. We, we can't, listen, if we're going to be kingdom people, we don't have a right to raise our kids the way that's easiest for us. We don't have a right to raise our kids the way that the world raises their kids. We don't have a right to handle our money the way that suits us. We don't have a right to treat our spouse any old way. We don't have a right not to honor the man of God. We don't have a right not to honor God with our tithes and offerings. You see, some of us have to come to a place where we stop having to make a decision every week that we need to make a decision every week. A long time ago, I settled in my heart that I'm not going to make a choice. I'm not going to struggle over whether I'm going to write a check for tithes and offerings. As soon as I got paid, the first and the best came off. Stop making that choice every week. Make it once and for all and settle it. Don't, there's never been a, a Parks kid in my house that ever asked the question, Dad, are we going to church this Sunday? It's never been asked. You know why? It was settled a long time ago. As long as you're healthy and your heart's beating, you're coming to church. You know, you have a lot of people say a lot of ridiculous things like, well, I don't want to force my kids to go to church because I don't want them to have the wrong attitude about it. Do you force them to brush their teeth? Do you force them to go to school? 
Do you force them to take a shower? Where do we get this garbage? Stop listening to the world. If we want kingdom seed, kingdom children, then we've got to stop trying to conform to the, to the spirit of the world. If you want children that are going to be above average, then stop raising them like everyone else. And start having some expectations of them. What if they don't like me? They'll get over it. You're not called to be your kid's best friend. But I'll tell you something. When you require something of them, I'll just tell you the progression that I saw. You know, and listen, I, we're in a different world, all right? Uh, don't go spanking your kids out in public. Right, right. If you do, you're foolish. Right. But I, I, we had corporal punishment in my house. Yep. <laughs> now, every kid is different. I don't know why I got on the kid thing, but it's good. I'm going to go with it. Every kid is different. My first son... He needed spankings, but not a, not a lot. My second son, unless his hiney was stinging, his ears weren't even open. <laughs> he, it just wasn't registering. And so, so, I mean, he got his tail wore out every day. But he's, he's a good, I mean, and it wasn't that he was rebellious. He was just distracted. You know, so uh, you'd say, go, go clean your room, son. Okay, and he had every intention of doing it until he saw that ball on the floor. <laughs> or that truck in the corner. And so it wasn't that he was rebellious, but he was distracted. Pretty colors, ooh. Right? And so, so understand, every kid is going to be different. My daughter, she may have had five spankings in her entire life. And now, the boys probably thought, well, she's the only girl and she's getting away with everything. She's the youngest. Which there may have been some of that true. I don't, you know, recall everything. But the truth of the matter is, is for the most part, if we said to do something, even if it's not something she wanted to do, she would go and do it. And might have been reluctantly, but she would go do it. And, uh, you know, my one son that had, had to get a lot of spankings, he would, he, would get, he would get a spanking, and then I'd say, okay, go to your room. And if he marched off stomping to his room and slammed his door, I'd say, let's take another lap. <laughs> All right, another dose of medicine, now go do it right. Now, let me give you a little insight. My oldest son is in full-time ministry. Uh, he has been probably for eight or ten years. Um, he's getting ready to pioneer a church down in Nashville next year. Um, he's written over 1,200 songs, most of them uh, praise and worship choruses. All right, so don't tell me that that was a bad thing. You'll hear other people say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want my kids. Christy said something about the kids being uh, listening, and when you were little, you listened to in with the big people, right? Can I tell you, we required that of our kids a lot of times, and I don't care if they're laying on a floor coloring, it's getting in. There are many things that they picked up laying on the, under a church, church chair, coloring beside us. And so don't, be, don't, don't think that it's not getting in. It is. Uh, my second son, is a, he's a pilot in the uh, military, and then he's in the reserves now, and so he's also got hired as an airline pilot. Um, and so he was an average student. All through school. My oldest son was an A student all the way through school. He required that of himself. My second son, he was a high C, low B school student. Uh, but he got in college based on his athletics. Uh, he got a scholarship for baseball. But when he got in college, he knuckled down and he was a high B student. And so it's not that they can't do it. A lot of times we like to make excuses for our kids. But really a lot of times what we're doing is making excuses for ourselves. You know? And so a lot of times, you know, we like oh, bad kids. A lot of times it's not bad kids so much as this poor parenting technique. Right. And so we just need to understand that. And then my, my daughter, Bethany, she's 25. Uh, she's a hairstylist down in Nashville. Very good kid. She's, uh, she, she's um, I, I, I'm very proud of her as well. 
Uh, she's going to college nights and weekends now and, and uh, doing self-study for, for additional college. But we need to understand that we don't have, as believers, if we're coming under the lordship of Christ, we don't have the right to do everything the way that's easiest for us. Everything that we do, everything that we touch, if we're kingdom people, it needs to have the character, nature, and quality of the kingdom of God. And so if you're running a business, your business, the decisions that you make shouldn't benefit your personal uh, agenda so much. Well, as a business owner, you have a personal agenda, and that's okay. But it should not be all about you. If you have responsibility for employees, in a very real sense, you have a responsibility to them before you even have the responsibility to yourself. Right. Okay? Uh, in, a, uh, in your household, you know, raise your children to the kingdom standard, not to the world standard. Manage your money in a way that is reflective of the kingdom of God, the character, nature, and qualities of the kingdom of God. And let your, as your kids get older, let them in on that. You know, as my kids got older, I would show them how I spend our money. Yeah. If I saw the checkbook ledger in your checkbook, I'd have a very good idea about what you value. Or your credit card statement. Right. And I quit tithing a long time ago. Because God brought me past tithing to more than 10%. That's just getting off. I would never consider not tithing and doing above tithe offerings above that. And, and the reason is, is when you establish that as your baseline, you're honoring God. Amen. When you write your tithe check, don't do that mindlessly or, or however you do it. I do it on a credit card because I like the points, but uh, I pay that balance off every month. So here's the deal. How many of you know the scripture says the borrower is servant to the lender? The way I do it, I turn it so that the lender is servant to me. Because I use their money for 30 days, I get the points, and then I pay it off, and I don't pay any interest. You see, we've got to be more shrewd than the people of the world. This is what this is about. You see, this whole kingdom thing, is it's about true lordship and bringing our, our, our whole everything that we do under the lordship of Christ so that we're smarter than the world. Okay? And so, um, so anyhow, I just throw that out there. I'm not really quite sure how I got there, but it, I, I believe it's good. I believe it's kingdom. I believe it's God. And so look with me in Matthew chapter 13. And what is the language of the Spirit? Parables, allegory, Type and shadow, symbols, numbers, classifications of scripture. You got historic, poetic, symbolic, prophetic. Okay? And so, so recognize this and recognize the frequency of something being mentioned. And so I want to encourage every one of you to be, get, become very, very familiar with Matthew chapter 13. Because I don't think of any other chapter that has more parables in it than Christ, uh, than, than, uh, of Christ than Matthew chapter 13. And so Matthew chapter 13 starts off with the parable of the soils. And so we'll just start there in verse 1 and go from there. It says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and, and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables. What did he speak to them in? Par what is a parable? A natural story with a spiritual application. Say that with me. A parable is a natural story with a spiritual application. And it reveals a mystery. How many of you want to know mysteries? Okay. Mysteries are for sons of the kingdom. If you don't want to know mysteries, that's okay. Because they're there for you when you're ready to know them. You see, he didn't sort people out like, okay, you can know the mystery. I mean, the people that wanted to know the mystery, they hung around to find out. It's very clear that initially the, the, the disciples, they didn't get it right away. And so there's two classifications of people you can't teach anything to. The guy that knows it already in his mind 
And the other classification is, is the person who doesn't care enough to find out. That's right. yeah, that's true. And I want to tell you something. Only you can determine whether that's correct. you care enough to find out. Yep. Okay? And so Matthew 13. I'm gonna, uh, let's see, I already read that verse. So he spoke to them many things, to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Now, we don't use those terms, and so we could say, Behold, a farmer went out to plant. Right? And as he planted, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them, and some fell on stony places, and they, were, uh, they uh, did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, and they, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Others fell on good ground. Everybody say good ground. Good ground. Uh, you want to be good ground, okay? Amen. And yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That ought to clue us in. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Fair question. Why did he speak to them in parables? He spoke to them in parables to protect the integrity of the mystery. Mysteries and secrets don't belong in the hands of people who don't care to know them. These are for everyone, but everyone's not going to get it. Right. You want to be the one that gets it. Yes. Okay? Why do you speak to them in parables? Because you are protecting the integrity of the mystery. The integrity of the message. This is the mysteries of the kingdom are not to be put in the hands of careless people or know it alls. You can't teach a know it all anything. And what happens a lot of times is because of our church history or our teaching or our doctrine, what happens so much of the time is rather than read out of scripture, we are reading into scripture. So if you believe in the rapture, you're going to read that in. If you believe in healing or that God doesn't heal, you're going to read that in. And so what we need to do is we need to come to the word of God, not with a stale eye that already knows it, but with a fresh eye. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, right? The kingdom of God are, you know, is of such, like the, child, the childlike. We've got to come to the scripture with a fresh eye and read out of it just as if it's the first time we've come to it yeah. in order to get the message because what happens so much of the time is, is we're reading into it rather than pulling out of it. Right. And so we read into it based on our history and what happens is, is we get deceived. And a lot of times you'll hear this, uh, you know, if somebody has a word from the Lord, well, you know, I felt like the Holy Spirit said that. And our response a lot of times is, well, does that line up with... Scripture? Where do you have a scripture for that? And really, the truth of the matter is, who inspired scripture? The Holy Spirit. So it requires the Holy Spirit to know it. And so, so rather than us saying, I'm going to judge everything that the Lord speaks to me out of scripture, a lot of times we need to be be reading scripture and allowing the Holy Spirit to interpret it for us. And so a lot of times we only look at it one way, but the truth of the matter is, is in order for us to really understand scripture, we've got to ask Holy Spirit to open our eyes. You, am I getting that? You understanding that? Rather than only say, uh, oh, I've got to have a scripture for that, we need to understand, uh, uh, you know, if the Holy Spirit speaks to us and we're looking for scriptural confirmation, a lot of times we need the Holy Spirit to even w open our eyes to the scripture. And so, and the truth of the matter is, let's think about this. How much scripture did the apostle has, have for some of the stuff they did? How much scripture did Jesus have for some of the miracles he did? Where, where in scripture did he say, spit on the ground and rub mud in someone's eye? 
Where do the apostles get out of Scripture uh, to lay uh, cloths on them and, and then send them to the person that needs healing? Where did, they come that, where did that come from? And so if the Scripture, Jesus said, greater, the things that I have done and greater things than these shall you do, then you don't have Scripture for some stuff. Right. And so let's get out of this religious mindset that we need Bible for everything. That's... <laughs> Listen, what we do should flow and it shouldn't, uh, you know, rub against the grain of Scripture. But at the same time, we need to recognize there's not going to be Scripture for everything. Right. And it's okay. We need to stop judging things based on our doctrine and judge things based on fruit. Amen. You know what I'm saying? And we're judging everything based on our doctrine. And we've gotten our doctrine by, by reading into Scripture. That's pretty shaky ground. And so, so we just need to understand, we need to be people of the Spirit. Let me ask you this. What translation of the Bible did the disciples have? Yeah. It was good enough for Jesus. King James is good enough for me. They didn't, they, they weren't walking around with Bibles. The Gutenberg Press wasn't even invented until 15th, 14th, 15th century. And so, you know, in the synagogues, they had scrolls of Scripture. And sure, they had, there were some versions of, of the prophets and, and uh, the law. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, as you look back in the early part of the book of Acts, it says they met from house to house in the synagogues and they, they abided in the apostles' doctrine. Right. Well, I wouldn't listen to any man. Where'd you get that? We all listen to a man. All that's, come, all that's been, you know, we're listening to men. Now, certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit, men. Right. But some of the stuff that we, we say without really thinking, we need to kind of reevaluate some of that. Okay? And so uh, he said, uh, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he said to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Right. To who? To the one who cared enough to say, why did you speak to him in parables? Right. That's true. Yeah. All right? It's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. The person that doesn't care enough to hang around and find out, it could be for them, but they don't care enough, and so it stinks to be them, I guess, you know? The answer is said to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And so the mysteries, the secret things... Of the kingdom, that's the Greek term, Basilia, the, the, the realm of, or the rulership, the royal rulership of, the kingdom of heaven, the spirit realm. Right. Right. And so one of the things that we need to understand this is that Jesus didn't come to give us a religion or denomination. He came to give us and to restore this thing called the kingdom. Right. Right. The kingdom has dominion. What Adam lost in the garden, Christ came to restore. And so, you know, what did he lose? He lost, really, he lost dominion. If you look in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis and the last few chapters of the book of Revelation, you pretty much have a complete story. Things come full circle. What do you have in the book of Genesis, the first few chapters? You have the tree of life. You have the river of life. You have open-faced relationship with God. You have complete harmony with creation. And then you look in the last few chapters of the book of Revelation. What do you have? Instead of a garden, now it's a city. But you pretty much have all the same characteristics. And so God wants to bring us back to this place of dominion. But you know what? If we don't first start having some dominion right here, we're never going to qualify... For greater dominion. Yeah. And so, you know, what is the root word of dis disciple? Discipline. We've got to begin to ask the Holy Spirit to give us the discipline to, so that we can honor Him with what we do with our hands and our mind and our money. Honor Him so that He then qualifies us to, to, to be ready to be elevated. Right. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that many of us, if, if we had a, a $10 million dropped in our lap, it'd ruin us. Why? Because we first haven't learned to handle $1,000 a week. And so God's all about uh, seed time and harvest. He's all about uh, honor. He's all about um, uh, kingdom, kingdom management of our resources and our time. Okay? And so it's very, very important. 
And so, so anyhow, he goes on through here and he's talking. Uh, he says, the, kingdom of, uh, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven have not been given to them. Now, we hate to think of that, but they're determined, every, every one of us determines whether the mysteries are for us or not. Okay? And so, uh, for whoever has, to him will be, more will be given, and to he who has an abundance, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, and uh, in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. The heart of this people has grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes have, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And so, what happens when, when the, the revelation and the mystery is thrown out there, there comes a choice that we have to make. Every one of us have to make a choice. Are we going to be sons of the kingdom that have an ear to hear the mystery and understand the mystery? Or do we just think we already know? And are we those who don't care enough to find out? You see, it is, isn't it interesting that the Jews had all the prophecy and the law all pointing to the coming Messiah? But when he showed up, they could not recognize him. Isn't that strange? Now, obviously some did because much of the early church were, were Jews. But the leaders were always listening and always looking for an opportunity to fault find. Not only fault find... But they took counsel together. How can we kill this joker? These are the people and that were, they were blind leaders of the blind. And so, listen, we need to understand that we shouldn't think that that... If that can happen to them, the people who they were trained and educated and positioned to look for the coming Messiah, they had all the scripture, yet when he showed up, they didn't recognize them. If that could happen to them, shouldn't we be cautious that it could happen to us? Yeah. Yeah. And so we need to be careful when we take pride in our, all of our biblical knowledge and our religious history, and I've been saved for so many years, because that necessarily is not a qualifier. You see, how many of you know we use the term practice makes perfect, but I would like to change that to practice makes permanent. Because if, we, if, we walk in, if we're walking in the same thing and we're never growing, we're never coming to greater understanding, then we're probably reading the scripture with a stale eye. Yeah. yeah. And so we need to be really careful. And we need to be those who are seekers of the kingdom. And so all, on, on through chapter 13 here, he, he discusses the parable of the kingdom, uh, the, the, the parable of the soils. And then the next, very next parable, he turns it on his head. So the, the parable of the soils is about the quality of the soil. Then the next parable is about the quality of the seed, not the soil. And so we need to understand that when Jesus, he was going through these parables to try to paint a picture for us, and he's like over and over saying, okay, here, this is the parable. He tells the parable. Do you got it? And people are like, and so he's like, okay, all right, forget that one. Here's another parable. And then he paints another picture. Do you get it? And one might be like, yeah, and the other might be, a, okay, well, all right, here's another parable. Do you get this? And then he like dumbs it down. All right, so he goes from the parable of the soils to the parable of the mustard seed. Here's a mustard seed. It's the smallest of seeds, but then it grows into a great tree, and, and the birds of the field, it can live in it. Do you get it? Okay. Um, let me see. Let me dumb it down a little more. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like a lady who had three measures of flour. Count them three. And they put a little yeast in there. And over time, there's no fireworks. There's no flash and bang. Snap, crackle, pop. None of that. It's not flashy. It's not sensational. But it is supernatural. 
And over time, that yeast works through the flour, works through the flour, works through the flour, works through, till it's all leavened. And that's how the kingdom works, and that's how it operates in us. Because as we yield ourselves and honor the Word of God, honor God with our tithes and offerings, honor God with our praise and our worship, honor God by coming and having fellowship with one another, honoring one another, honoring the brothers and sisters. You need to understand when people, when we gather together, the kingdom operates on honor, and we're honoring one another. I love getting together with the people of God because we get to hug each other's neck and share each other's victories and bear one another's burdens. All right? And so, so the kingdom of God operates like that. And so as you're saved as a young believer, a new believer, and you're honoring God with a little, what's he do? Look in Luke chapter 6, 16. It's got these three principles. Faithful with little, faithful with much. Faithful with another man's, he'll give you your own. Learn how to handle resources. When it talks about uh, 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 unrighteous mammon, it's just talking about natural resources. If you don't handle unrighteous mammon or natural resources, your money, your time, your talents, in a kingdom manner, who will trust unto you the true riches, which are the mysteries of the kingdom? Okay? And so those three principles are principles that God gives us so that we can begin to have something to grade ourselves against. Faithful with little, faithful with much. If I'm not honoring God with 100 bucks a week, uh, when I'm making 100 bucks a week, the truth of the matter is I probably won't if I'm making $1,000 a week. Do you understand? And so the poverty mentality really has nothing to do with your income. It has to do with how you think and operate with your income. Faithful with little, faithful with much. If you don't take care of your bicycle and get it out of the rain and keep the spokes tightened up, you're not going to change the oil in your car. Faithful with little, faithful with much. If you're working for um, Walmart and you're scamming time when no one's looking, faithful with another man's, he'll give you your own. If you're not being faithful with another man's, you're showing God that you're not qualified to have your own. This sounds really basic, and it really is. But if we don't understand how the kingdom operates, if we don't understand how that, that little leaven and that measures of flour, how that, it's not flashy, it's not showy, it's not spectacular, but it is supernatural. If we will be faithful in those things, I don't care if no one is acknowledging your faithfulness. If God is acknowledging it, that's all you need. You see, I've seen people who have gone from nothing to something. I've got a friend who started with Walmart dipping guppies in the pet department. I, I'd like to bring him here sometime, you guys, and let him speak to you because you'll see this guy is a kingdom man. He started off, he's like 19 years old with Walmart dipping guppies. And within a short amount of time, he was the manager of the pet department. Soon he was one of the three or four managers of the store. Soon he became, uh, no, we, start, we sent a guy to another town to plan a new work, and he felt like the word of the Lord was for him to go with that person to this other town to plant a new work. And so the ministry there blessed him to do that, and he went and uh, found ways to make himself as useful as possible. He learned to play the drums. He did all kinds of stuff. He was doing everything. He got a, transferred with Walmart to this new town. Within a, a, a short time, he was uh, one of the few managers there. And um, the manager that had, was there was a pretty young guy, had no plans of retirement. But how many of you know Walmart grew exponentially in a yeah. short amount of time? And so what happened was is their bonuses were going up, their their uh, 401ks were going up, there were t- everything was going up, and so uh, so anyhow, this manager uh, decides to go somewhere else, and um, the district manager said, "Let's move the who's the guy that drives the gold Honda?" And the guy was like, "Oh, that's Henry Jordan. Yeah, let's move him up then to this new spot." Okay, come to find out. There was another guy who drove a gold Honda, not Henry Jordan, and that's who this person meant to promote. And so Henry, Henry was like, holy crap. And so 
he and his wife would go to this store at four in the morning and they just begin to walk up and down the aisles praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, and say, say, God, we're in over our head. And they had a real problem with, um, that store had a real problem with um, shoplifting. And so, you know, part of their bonuses and everything are based on their profit margins and, and shoplifting and all this kind of stuff and how to mitigate all of that and, and volume of sales and everything. And so they begin to just pray in the Holy, every morning they get there before anybody else did and start praying in the Holy Ghost, walking those aisles. And they had to do budgeting and everything like this. Well, Pretty soon, they had a, a district sales ma- meeting, and, and they all had to bring their budgets and everything like this, and everybody was doing their budgets of, of the other stores, and Henry was like, this is the first time he'd ever done a budget, and he was like, I don't even know how to spell budget, let alone do a budget, and, <laughs> and so he was like sweating bullets, and so he was like the last one, and they took his budget and put it up on the uh, uh, PowerPoint, you know, blah, 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 and, it, and, the, and the district sales manager was like, this is how a budget should look. This is how you do a budget. And everything, every, all the numbers and metrics were better. They had, had drastically reduced shoplifting, and God just began to promote him. Why? Because he was faithful. He was faithful. Listen, I don't have to be the most talented guy in the world. Every one of us, we need to understand we're given certain natural talents, but listen, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You don't have to be the brightest light on the tree. You don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed. Whatever, what other ones can I do? All right? But what every one of us has the capacity to do is be faithful. Be faithful. What is faithful? Full of faith. Full of faith. And so he was faithful. And so anyhow, he became the manager of that store, which was one of the biggest super centers in the company. Well, then the Holy Spirit says, it's time for you to move back to the home church. And he's like, okay. And so he tells his manager, um, I, feel, I really feel like it's time for me to go back to Panama City, blah, blah, blah. And the guy's like, well, listen, if you go from being a manager, even if it's to, to an associate manager, that's a career ender. And he's like, so be it. I, I, this is what I feel like is uh, the Lord's requiring of me right now. And so, so the guy's like, all right, you know, hey, it's your career. And so they waited for an opening in, Pan- in, in that town, the other town, Panama City, and he went, and he went to one of the smallest stores in the, in the, in the uh, uh, company as an associate manager. And the manager there was a young man and had no intention of retiring. And so he, he was like, no, no problem. So he just did his, did his job, but he was faithful, and he did everything as unto the Lord, regardless of who was watching. Amen. You see, some of you, uh, you probably think, well, my, ba- my boss is a rascal. It doesn't matter. You have somebody else to be accountable to. And so he was faithful, and his boss had no intentions of retiring. And lo and behold, one day the guy shows up, and he said, Henry, my wife and I sat down this weekend, and we did all of our, our investments and our this and that. He said, we've decided to retire. Well, guess who got to be the manager of that very small store? Henry. Well, within six months of that, Walmart announced building the biggest super center in Panama City Beach, Florida, and closing this one down. Guess who got to be the new manager of that? So don't look at things in the natural. Look at things through the eye of the Spirit. And so this is a guy who had no college education. His quarterly bonuses were probably more than a lot of us make a year. And so within a very short period of time, that store was doing fantastic, moving a lot of volume, and uh, he got a call to be a regional sales manager. And so he was a real, real regional sales manager for a while. And then by, uh, when, I, when I was living in Roanoke, Virginia, one day he called me and said, Hey, Terry, uh, I'm going to be in Roanoke uh, for a couple days this week. I'd like to take you to lunch. I said, Great. Just let me know when and where. I'll, I'll, I'll keep regular office hours. And so he called me. Come to find out, you know how he got there? On a Learjet. And at this time, he was a senior vice president now living in Bentonville, Arkansas, working at headquarters. Now, this is a guy who had no natural thing that would say, that guy's shooting to the top. (laughs) All right? But he knew 
how to honor God. He knew how to honor the ministry. He knew how to honor the body of Christ. He was a giver. And he was faithful, full of faith. Faithful as a day is long. And so each of us need to understand that this isn't just about what, you know, we've got to realize that the kingdom of God is an economy outside the economy. And the principles of God will operate in any economy, any country, for any age, at any time. And that the natural, just because this area may not have the highest per capita income, that doesn't matter. Listen, and I want to prophesy to you today that there are business ideas resident in you right now. There are inventions in you right now. There are promotions in you right now. But we we got to get we got to get out of this natural mindset yep. and recognize that the natural laws, while they do apply, we also have another thing at work: yep. the kingdom. Yes. And God honors those who honor Him. Amen? Amen. And so we see He goes down through there, and we can read all the other parables. But the, the, the big takeaway here is, is that, listen, we are stewards of the mystery. There are many mysteries, and we are stewards. If we don't care enough to find out what the mystery means, then we're saying something to God. We're saying that we, we're not going to honor that. Now, listen, we don't say that. We don't even think that. But our actions will speak that. And so we need to understand that there's, you know, we need to submit ourselves to God. We need to submit ourselves to the Word of God. And we need to be people that are faithful in all that we do. Because God, listen, God will promote you in ways that you had never thought of. Now, I'm a farm boy from Pennsylvania, and I work for the U.S. Treasury Department. I'm, I have a job situation right now that our, our agency doesn't do. But God saw, I had favor with God and favor with them, and they made an exception to policy for me. And I'm telling you, God will honor you. God will honor you as you honor him. The kingdom operates based on honor. The kingdom operates on seed time and harvest. The kingdom operates on faith with little, faith with much, faith with another man. He'll make you faithful over your own faithful with your resources and he'll trust unto you the true riches and so all of us are in a process of qualifying for those true riches those mysteries of the kingdom and i and i tell you something i I just came back from a vacation in florida and part of the vacation was we were down there celebrating the 48th year of ministry of the apostle that set me in ministry back in 1993 he's 88 years old and um that congregation is no bigger than this congregation but they have changed the world and there are, there are people there uh, that God has just thrown open the doors of heaven and throw, thrown open banking, um, inventions. There's a guy, a, a minister there, that God gave him a vision for his thing that works in the um, uh, in computer industry that has been taken through all these different labs. He's gotten funding from di- different things and literally has the, has the potential of being a game changer when it comes to information security. We're not talking about millions of dollars. We're talking about billions of dollars. I saw a guy who, when I first knew him, he couldn't rub two nickels together, and he wrote a check for a half a million dollars to sow into the kingdom of God. So these are... People no different than you and me. Who did Christ choose to be apostles? Regular folk. He could have gone to the ivory towers of education in Jerusalem and gotten the the smartest, brightest, most eloquent, learned people out of the ivory towers of academia of the Jewish world. But who did he get? Fishermen. Tax collectors, regular folks. I don't know if you've ever been around fishing docks, but fishermen are some rough-talking 
jokers. <laughs> There's a reason why they say that so-and-so cusses like a sailor. They make a sailor blush. But he chose regular people. Why? To show us it's regular folks who change the world. Amen? Amen. And so, and so I'll leave you with this, and I'll turn it over to, to Pastor Keith. If there's anything I can encourage you with, I'd, uh, be faithful in your giving. For God so loved the world that he... If you want to be the nature of, of the nature of the kingdom, then be a giver. Pray in the Holy Ghost. There's nothing that has been more transformative in my life than praying in the Spirit. Nothing, 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 nothing. There's no shortcuts. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Be a worshiper. If the only time you worship is here, it's a new day, be a worshiper. Worship in your car. Worship in your home. Amen? Worship in tongues. Worship in the understanding. Be a worshiper. And be a student of the Scripture. Amen? Amen. Amen. I bless you this, this morning. And... Um, Bring you greetings from Pastor Tim. Tim's having a great time. Yeah, yeah. That brother can shuck corn, man. He can preach. <laughs> That's a southern colloquialism, Blake. That brother can shuck corn. <laughs> Amen? Amen? He's having a great time. I really appreciate all, you know, get Blake and Bree and, and Aaron and Nova and all the other folks that are coming down to help. Tremendous people. Tremendous blessing. Um, and things are going really, really good down there. Uh, seeing new faces frequent, uh, you know, all the time, people that are excited to be there, and um, we're seeing great things, amen? And so, uh, so anyhow, I highly encourage you also, you know, always be somebody, if you're on Facebook, share the messages from this house, share the messages from the White Sox too, share it on your Facebook page, share, uh, invite people all the time, let them know where you are when you come into the church parking lot, just check in on Facebook. I'm telling you, that's all free advertising that we're not using. Just do it. Amen. Just like Nike says, just do it. Amen. Amen. I bless you.